Okay. Well, good morning, or from my perspective, good afternoon, um, for those of you who are not in the USA. I I'm Wadi Gedreich, and I'm going to be moderating this session. And this is a sort of miscellaneous session, which we're going to do all sorts of really interesting bits. But for those of you who have been dedicated to cell biology, etc., this morning, this is going to be different. Um, so we're going to go through the presentations and talk about them that hopefully you've seen already. And we're going to start with Torsten Bova from Denmark, who's produced a fascinating talk on um, dermatological applications. Um, first of all, Torsten, you, you use a 20 megahertz probe. I don't think I've ever come across a 20 megahertz probe. Um, was it made specially for you? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a probe that we make, uh, make in-house. Um, and it's it's sort of um, that's that's the background that, uh, that that I have in ultrasound. So so we knew how to make high frequency ultrasound. So that was the, the basis of the company. And Torsten, how deep can your twenty megahertz probe treat? Yes. So so at, at high frequency, obviously, there's a lot of, of attenuation. So we have sort of validated down to about a centimeter, but not not more than that. So so, so it will actually go a whole centimeter in depth. Yeah, but of, obviously you need to turn up the, the the power in order to get to that that depth. But uh, so we are comfortable in in five millimeters and and above. That's sort of where we have the, the clinical right clinical applications. So for for me that, that that starts to be very interesting because we're talking about basal cell carcinoma in in your talk. Um, do you think this technique might replace the surgery for basal cell carcinoma? Yeah, if we can get it for the for the relatively early phase, so so it shouldn't be obviously um, it shouldn't be too deep, but if we if we catch it in the early phases, then then it replaces the uh, the surgery, and we can have patients in and just keeping keeping new uh, occurrences uh, on track, so uh, or, or in check. Well, which is why I was trying to understand about the depth, because many basal cell carcinomas can be quite invasive locally, yeah. and. The question is whether you'll be able to go right down to the bottom of that and treat a cuff. Do you think? Yeah, you're... yeah. I mean, there's there is a, obviously a, a limit, but uh, but so far the, the the patients that we've seen have been been treatable, uh, and either in just a, a simple single pass, or we can go with a deep probe and then uh, do a treatment there, and then do a second pass with a with a more shallow probe, so we have the full column. And... So what other skin diseases do you think you'll be able to treat with this technology? So I think the, the basal cell carcinoma is obviously the, the biggest one. It's the biggest uh, cancer indication uh, there is. But then, then it's all of the, the families, the Kaposi sarcoma, it's the, it's the pre-cancer condition, the actinic kyptosis. Uh, and then it's, it's all of those uh, different viral warts and, and uh, uh, different conditions uh, sort of in the same family of of uh, of, of BCC and, and AK and warts and so on, so it's a, we have in, identified about twenty five different indications that are all sort mm -hmm. of originating from the uh, from the, the basal uh, cell membranes or, or basal membranes. So, so that's that's sort of the, the world that we have. And some of these will be obviously the benign skin diseases. You mentioned warts and papillomas and that sort of stuff. What about the sort of the more regular benign skin diseases that we see that perhaps are difficult to treat with drugs? Yeah, I mean, any we, we are basically, um, we, are, we, we do not care what, what is in the, the skin volume that we treat. We can, uh, we can remove whatever we can sort of get with those, those uh, uh, shoulder by shoulder lesions. So, so we can remove tattoo pigment, we can remove the AKs, and we can remove the, the cancers. Uh, as long as we can get to them from the surface, then, then we are, then we are yeah. in, in the game. What about melanoma? Uh, I think that's that's probably. I mean, we were we were advised against it from the very beginning, saying don't go there because it's yeah. it's just uh, it's just a too um, too dangerous uh, clinical yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People would be a bit more nervous about that, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, perhaps we should move on then. Thank you very much, Torsten. That's really a really interesting talk. Um, Chris Chivers. Yeah. Biofilms. I know nothing yeah. about biofilms. What are biofilms? So biofilms basically are whenever you can have bacteria that will adhere to a surface, whether it be a biologic surface within the human body or a medically uh, medical device, maybe that we inserted in the hospital. And once they adhere to it, they'll kind of excrete a extra uh, cellular polysaccharide matrix that kind of engulfs around the bacteria and it allows them to basically adhere to either the biofilm within the body 
whether it's a biologic surface they're attaching to or if it's a medical device that they're attaching to, and can then pretty much allow them to kind of harbor there and then kind of break off and go and seed to other portions of the body um, and really kind of acts as a, a seeding point for them. And it, can make it, it can be very hard to penetrate with uh, drugs and stuff. Yeah, so, so they hide from systemic drugs, basically. Is that what you're saying? You got it. Yeah. And if you're going to be disrupting these biofilms with um, focused ultrasound, let, and let's take your example, urinary catheters, how often would you have to do that? So that I, I don't think we have fully discovered how often we'd have to do that because most of the studies we have done have been completely in the lab. Um, yeah. But if we were to move this more to a preventative side where we maybe had a, a small transducer that just sat external to the catheter and just periodically treated, um, I'd have to look into the literature and see how far a biofilm could grow, you know, maybe in a day's time to really answer that question. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, do you think this type of treatment that you're suggesting would be feasible for other catheters or, or um, elsewhere within the body, particularly in the vascular chart? Absolutely. So I think we kind of started with the urinary catheter because it's a uh, kind of simpler concept to use because if we were to then treat the biofilm, we can do a quick, easy flush of the biofilm and then we just leave the body. Absolutely. I think we could apply it to central lines, thick lines, other, you know, maybe ventricular peritoneal shunts um, and anything like that. We could really apply it to our concern there would be that if we're treating a bacteria that goes into systemic vasculature, that there's potential to maybe release something like LPS and cause kind of a systemic inflammatory reaction. So I think going forward, that's something we want to test and see um, how that would play out. We'd absolutely love to kind of transition it to um, other medical devices. And now, what about the possibility of seeding infection more distally? Let, let's let's imagine you're um, doing this treatment to a central catheter in lying in the superior vena cava, and it's got some Klebsiella or something on it. Would you seed that infection distally around the body by doing this? Uh, I think you absolutely run the risk, but I think you run that same risk when you remove the catheter as well, because eventually that central line is going to come out either way. And when you pull it out, you have a, you know, a propensity to potentially shear off some of that biofilm and have it then go distal. Um, so I think that's something that definitely would need to be studied and really compare it to kind of that standard of care of removing the catheter versus treating it with uh, hysteropsy. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, um, we're moving on to... Oh, we've, we've got an, an update question on the chat line, which I'll just take very quickly, and that's for uh, Torsten. And um, the question is, what is the temperature that of the deposition on the skin surface? And do you monitor the temperature when you're doing this procedure? So we don't have a temperature monitor inside the, the, the probe. We have a, but we have quite a good idea about the temperature development. So, so in the focal point, focal point, which is extremely small because of that, that high frequency, uh, we have temperatures reaching some, somewhere around 70 to 80 degrees, uh, generating this, uh, this acute uh, necrosis. But on the surface, we have, we have very little effect because the, the angle of, of, uh, of treatment is, uh, is, 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 I mean, the F number is, is such that we don't have this intensity on the skin surface. So it's not something that that burns on the skin surface. We actually we deposit the uh, the energy extremely concentrated down in the in the focal point. Okay, great, thank you, Torsten. Now let's move on to Wojciech Kwiatkowski, um, and it, this is a fascinating um, idea of actually targeting the aortic valve. Um, without any intervention, because we've seen a huge amount of um, noise from cardiologists about putting in trans um, catheter aortic valves recently, um, tabbies in my experience. Um, how difficult is it to target the moving leaflet of the aortic valve with focused ultrasound? Well, in fact, the... the um, we use uh, uh, an imaging uh, view of the aortic valve that is really classical for uh, the uh, diagnosis of the uh, aortic stenosis. And on this view, the, the, the valve is not uh, so mobile as we could imagine. And so uh, with, we can target the, the, the valve uh, with, a, with a transducer without uh, 
having uh, concerns of the of the movement. Okay, so so the actual disease process actually helps you target it. Kind yes, of, it's moving more slowly. Yeah, somehow. Yeah, in yeah. yeah. Also, um, now Wojciech, um, have you done Dopplers? of the carotids when you've been administering administering this therapy to see if there are any bits and pieces going superiorly? Or have you done MRIs before and after to see if there are any um, silent sequelae to this therapy? Yes, in fact, um, um, we didn't perform Dopplers, but uh, well, in the, um, you're talking about all the debris that could come out from the valve. Uh, and. Uh, you have to. Uh, what's important in the aortic stenosis is that the calcifications are embedded within the, the valve. Uh, they're uh, embedded in um, uh, tissues of the, of the within the leaflets of the, the valve, and so the calcifications. It's very rare to have a calcification, calcification uh, directly out of the valve, and so we have studied uh, the, the dose of energy to deliver. Uh, and uh, an er energy that would, would, would will not damage the valve, for example, to uh, to uh, induce any uh, uh, debris uh, coming out. And we also uh, studied in vitro on uh, explanted uh, human valves that had calcification that uh, there are not any uh, large debris uh, coming out. And also, uh, we have treated today. 20 patients so far, and on some of the patients we performed uh, an MRI, <clears throat> yes. and no any no, no abnormalities were detected. And also for every patient we perform a mini mental state examination. It's a, 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 a qualitative uh, test on the performances of the of the patients of the cognitive performances, and there were no. And it, there was no uh, deterioration detected at th one, three, and six months after the therapy. So finally, we have no um, signs that anything is uh, going out of the valve. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, let, let's move along to um, Narendra. Um, so this is a very interesting application of stem cell work and in an area where patients are often fairly hopeless. Um, when you administer the stem cells, do you do it in the musculature and surrounding tissues around the vasculature, or do you try and get it actually into the, um, the adventitia of the vessel itself? Uh, no, just the surrounding. Near, just, near the vessel, the... A vascular ultrasound detected the defective part, and that's marked on the skin. So that's the yeah. area. The and, stem cells are know, and how many sites will you enter along the course of that vessel? Uh, the, the, around uh, five to ten sites, depending on the length. Yes, yes, yes. The and originally... Before we started the study, the uh, people thought that we may have to uh, inject the stem. Word found out that that was, that was not the case. Right, right. And um, in your talk, it's obviously all peripheral, below knee. But ha have you tried larger vessels as well? I think we. Only, only below the knee area. Uh, only below the knee. Only below the knee. Um, okay. And um, the the main outcome is that you've stabilised these patients' deterioration, which is obviously a massive achievement in these poor people who have severe peripheral um, vascular disease who are moving inexorably onto amputations. Really. Um, how optimistic are you that you may be able to go beyond stabilizing them and actually improve them? And what, what changes would you need to make to your therapy to go that way? Well, number one, as you know, these are only five patients per, per group. So we really don't have a, a complete understanding of the regrowth 
for regeneration of the blood vessels as well. So the, the next study we plan to do is to really do some more imaging and find out have we really improved the, the flow rates. Okay, great. Thank so you. This, this study does not really give us the, the definitive aspect of the improvement in terms of statistical significance. No, no, indeed. But 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 it's a it's a glimpse. It's a it's an opening, isn't it, into this area? Yeah. The whole idea Wonderful. was that uh, uh, are we going to be able to uh, perform the study first of all without any you know some sort of a side effect. And the second, how good the yeah. uh, tolerance of this uh, study was going to be. And what we found it is that uh, without anesthesia, uh, we were able to apply the ultrasound and then the patient was yeah. awake and it was pretty safe. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's move on to our, our final um, presenter, which is Gilles Dubenal from Lyon. Um, Gilles, this is a really interesting area. I mean, it's, it's an area I'm very involved with in the diagnosis of as well. Um, as I was looking through the talk, I, I saw you that you had treated some patients with sigmoid um, endometriosis. How on earth did you get that probe up high enough to treat the sigmoid? Oh, sorry, okay. Okay, uh, sorry, it was at the beginning of the study. So I, I was, uh, your diagnosis of the location of the lesion was performed on uh, sonography only, not on MRI. That's why we, we included some patient with uh, sigmoid lesions. Uh, yes. In the second part, it was only patient with, uh, with uh, rectal locations and some uh, junction between uh, rectal and sigmoid colon. Yes, so it's, yes, so it's pulling down, yes. Mm -hmm. um, did you see any uterine damage with uh, uh, along the myometrial margin at the site of these adhesions? No, no, we don't. We don't. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, we are not afraid by this uh, point because uh, the beginning of the lesions, uh, it started at, at uh, uh, an external adenomyosis. So, which will the precision of treatment is uh, really important. So, we will treat yes. uh, maybe a few millimeters of uh, external adenomyosis. So, there is no damage, uh, damage okay. of the uterine. And how deep were the were, were your focused ultrasound? Um, spots beyond the rectal, beyond the, if you like, the serosa of the rectum. So we will uh, we'll take three millimeters between the mucosa and the beginning of treatment, only three millimeters. And the, 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 the rectal wall is cooled by, uh, by the balloon, which uh, yes. with uh, cold but, water inside. But, but often the adhesions that you see in endometriosis, like um, the, you know, the, the recto-uterine, recto-cervical, recto-vaginal lesions, they're often quite long, aren't they? They may be a sort of a centimeter or more. I do, sorry, but, I, don't, I didn't understand. What, what, what? Oh, the, the length of the fibrotic plaque that you see um, adjacent to the rectum is often rather longer than that. Um, yeah. Are you able to go further and treat the rest of that plaque? Yes, uh, we have started a, a new study now. With uh, we will include uh, 38 patients. We have already treated for nine, uh, six patients, and for two patients, we also treated the vaginal lesions. So it's, I think it's not it's not a problem. In fact, you are right. It's the same it's the same lesion. So so we will treat uh, it. It will be yeah. bad not to treat all the lesions to stop only to rectal endometriosis. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And do you think you'll be able to go further forward into the adenexal areas to treat some of the fibrotic plants, plaques that you see there? Or is that just a bit too far? In annexa? Yeah, into the adenexal area. No, no, no. I don't, I, we don't want We don't want it. It's too far. Yeah. Just, uh, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, safe, it's safe for the rectal locations. For the vagina, I think there is no risk, uh, the uh, limited risk of rectovaginal fistulae, but for the, for the annexa or other location, uh, except for adenomyosis, which is a very good posterior adenomyosis, which is a really interesting location, I think, with a, with a focal one probe. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Gilles. Well, Thank you. I think all that remains is for me to thank all the presenters for their excellent um, 
new innovative talks which I think have been extremely stimulating to all of us and I hope to see you see more from all of you at the next Focus Dog Sound meeting. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.